following is a special presentation of Lack Sports Network. When the August skies opened up over 5th Third Bank Stadium in Kennesaw, Georgia, the Denver Outlaws trailed the Ohio machine by six goals in the Major League Lacrosse Championship game. And we have some lightning. We're going to have a delay here. Obviously, you have to do this, and if you're Denver, couldn't come at a better time. One way to cut momentum. But overcoming adversity was nothing new to the Outlaws. They had built an entire season around it. Gone into a locker room at two and six and, and looking around thinking that, you know, you could be at the bottom of the barrel of this league very easily by the time that this season ends. Just what we went through as a team, I couldn't help, I just started crying. I don't think that there was anyone in our locker room really that felt safe. We have nothing to lose, let's go out there and play, have fun, and that's what we did. Every storm has a different origin. It may be a drop of rain, or a clap of thunder, or a flash of lightning. For the 2016 Denver Outlaws, the dark clouds had gathered months before. And the Outlaws are in danger of missing the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. Fresh off a championship run, the 2015 Denver squad limped to a final record of seven and seven missing the MLL playoffs. The outlaw season is over. The champs will not get a chance to defend their title in the postseason. It was definitely a season in which it was a franchise that was in transition. So many of the names that fans had come to watch over the years, they were moving on. Lee Zink had retired the year before, and then Jesse retires. So there were still some familiar faces on hand, the Eric Laws, the Jeremy Sieverts, the Drew Snyders, but there was a sense that this was a franchise that was kind of starting to turn the page a little bit. After 2014 and winning our first championship in franchise history, sort of had somewhat of a, a hangover for the 2015 season. We've had a great tradition of being a strong team that made the playoffs every single season. 2015, not making the playoffs for the first time. I think the big goal was to make sure that we get back there. The 2016 MLL draft was held on January 22nd in Baltimore, Maryland. The event was moved from 8.30 in the evening to two o'clock in the afternoon. The reason, an impending storm. Matt Cavanaugh was a 21-year-old attackman that spent four years playing at the University of Notre Dame. Students often speak of subterranean passages on the South Bend campus. For Cavanaugh, the underground tunnels would be replaced by a new path, one situated a mile high. The top priority in the draft was to get a left-handed attackman. There were several you know, that we had on our draft board, but Matt was among the top, so when he fell to five, we were, we were thrilled. With the fifth overall selection in the 2016 MLL Collegiate Draft, the Denver Outlaws select Matt Cavanaugh attack Notre Dame. We followed him for three years in college. We watched a lot of tape on him, a lot of live games on him. He's a tremendous player. We really thought he was going to be a great MLL player. Being the fifth player taken in round one comes with great expectations. Being the 57th player taken in round seven comes with none. I don't think goalie was on our mind very much as far as the draft was concerned. And then all of a sudden in the fifth and sixth round, we went, oh man, Kelly's still there. The Denver Outlaws select Jack Kelly, goalie, Brown. I saw a couple goalies got taken before me and I was a little, I wouldn't say bitter, but I was a little surprised. It just gave me more motivation to play that season at Brown with everything I had. Seeing five goalies go before you when you're obviously think you're the best goalie in the college league. Kelly didn't need an Ivy League education to learn that rookie goalies seldom find success in the professional game. The difference, I think, from college to the pros is in college you have guys who can shoot the ball really fast. You have guys who, who can shoot a little slower and they can place it in the corner. Only the top, top guys can really do both, but that's everybody here in this league. Denver staff set a plan to return to prominence. Coming into 2016, you know, the ultimate goal is to set yourself up to compete for a championship and 
We felt real good about uh, our drafts, in particular our college drafts. So uh, we came into 2016, we had a great training camp, and uh, we thought that things were in place. We had a lot of new faces. I remember at training camp counting about eight Outlaws helmets of the, I don't know, 25, 30 guys we had at training camp. So it was, uh, you know, sort of same goal, but different group of guys that we had trying to achieve that goal. The 2016 Outlaws would be led by a core of all-star caliber players. The names Sieverts, Law, and Bocklet displayed on the backs of their orange and black jerseys. But it was three other names that, when strung together, garnered the most attention and acclaim. John Grant Jr., a two-time league MVP and five-time MLL champion. The 41-year-old was still considered to be among the very best in the game. I love John. I love John. Growing up in Coquillam, I got to watch him play. He's an exceptional indoor player and, and one of the best players of all time and, and still is in the world. After the final regular season game the prior season, we went down to the locker room with my then eight-year-old son, who had really become very interested in lacrosse and he was getting a chance to meet some of the players. And he got a chance to meet John Grant Jr. And he was just the classic definition of in awe of John Grant Jr. And, Junior couldn't have been any nicer and more gracious and gave my son a lacrosse stick, which he still has hanging reverentially in his room right now. On May 1st, over 2,600 fans lined the seats of Sports Authority Field at Mile High Stadium, hoping to see an Outlaws win in their season opener against the Ohio Machine. Here's Bitter again. Shot score! Here comes Ohio. On the run! Oh, what a beautiful play! With the game tied deep into the fourth quarter, the Outlaws turned to their all-star midfielder, Drew Snyder. The surname Snyder descends from the German word for Taylor. The ending for Denver was a perfect fit. And here comes Sieberts with the ball. Watch out, he may like to try to take that two-pointer. Sets it up, another two-pointer! Snyder with a two! And just like that, the Outlaws are in front. We're just looking to, to get a look there at the end. Uh, not necessarily looking for a two, but um, at least a one to tie the game up. Uh, fortunate for us that uh, we got a look from the two-point line, and Jerry uh, drove hard and, and passed it over to me, and I kind of swept across the top and just kind of pulled it. I think going into that possession, you're looking to just get one and push it into overtime, but obviously to take a two is a gutsy play by Drew. And we're going into the locker room feeling like we kind of snuck away with the game there. We could have played better. I don't know if we technically deserved to win that game, but we ended up with a win, and. Uh, it was just nice to be able to start the season off one now. Game two offered a case of deja vu. Another close contest decided late against Ohio. The familiarity ended in overtime. Schreiber tried to pick up the ground ball. Stanwick's got it with 22 on the shot clock. Down to Holman, bounces it in. Game over. Machine win on a tough angled shot by Marcus Holman. The Outlaws suffered their first loss of the season. It quickly became a trend. The team would lose three straight and worse, a sense of its identity. And so the final seconds are going to tick off, and the Atlanta Blaze are going to notch their first victory in the inaugural season of Atlanta Blaze across by a final score of 23-12 over the Denver Outlaws. Coach O'Hara is going to say, we got to change some things here, boys. A lot of things to correct for the Outlaws. Well, this was the first time that I'd been on an Outlaws team that got beat that bad. I can't remember. We. We were never in that game. Yeah, we just didn't really show up. I don't know what to say. They, credit to them, they just jumped up on us. It was a rainy night, but it was a win for the Chesapeake Bayhawks over the Denver Outlaws. Back-to-back -back weeks now that Denver surrendered 20-plus goals, and they will have to clean things up on that end if they want to turn this season around. Those were kind of uncharted waters for us. I know we, we wore orange shorts on the road to try and change it up when we went to Chesapeake, just trying to find something to, to, to switch it up a little bit. But some tough, tough games there. I think there was some concern about the three-game losing streak, mainly because there was so much uncertainty in goal. Rookie goaltender Ryan LaPlante was pulled for veteran Johnny Rodriguez in back-to-back -back games. Johnny Rodriguez now in net for the Outlaws as Ryan LaPlante after giving up nine goals. Rice throws it over to Dion, he shoots, scores! After that game, that's when you know I started to get pretty nervous about what we were doing as a team and, and how we were gonna pull it back together. 
Despite John Grant Jr. recording his 500th career point, the Outlaws were struggling with a record of one in three. It's one of those things where you're looking at this team and you're wondering, what is their identity going to be? What are they going to rally around? And you couldn't really find anything because this team for so long had been known as a team that would get up and down on you and they would have good defense and they would lock down on the back end and they weren't able to do that. While most teams enjoy a home field advantage, the Denver Outlaws relish it. We got back home in front of the home crowd. I mean, that was three tough weeks of travel, I think, where we lost those three games. And uh, to get back home was good for us and got our feet under us a little bit and played well against Boston. I just remember the focus of everyone at that practice on Friday night before Boston and everyone kind of just feeling, not necessarily pressure, but almost just like it's time to, to put up and show what you can do. On a typical game day, the Outlaws field 19 players. On this day, almost half of them would score. John Grant Jr. behind the back flip. Sebastiani, who's got a goal, flips in front. Ball moves around, shot, score! Here's John Grant Jr. Backside. Pass, score! Oh, what a nifty pass. The onslaught continues. That was just a huge emotional win for us. Going into practice on that Friday night, it was a big deal just to kind of be back at home, and it was kind of a moment in the season where it was kind of, where's this season gonna go? I remember being really pleased with how everybody played at both ends of the field and put a complete game together. And that was something we were really searching for at that point in the year. Yeah, that was big for us, you know, especially playing here. You always want to win at home. We kind of have the advantage. We've, we've got the best crowd in the league, and there's nobody that plays in front of a better crowd or better stadium than us, so it, it's pretty special. Anytime we play at home, get a big win. The celebration would be short-lived. Another storm was under production, with the parts of rain, lightning, and thunder being played by New York, Florida, and Rochester. The Lizards crept past yet another Denver goaltender, thanks in part to a late and controversial offsides call. I thought Bakla was tripped. Oh, they, they got it. They're going to say Denver was offsides? And White offside, 30. And on out. Oh, we got the ball! If you go back and look at that, I'm very skeptical of that call. I'd love to see the uh, video replay on that one because I still think that we were on sides and they were counting their players. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially with us having the ball with the chance to try to tie the game at the end there. But you can never blame a loss on the rest. I truly do believe that. Drew Adams and Tony Seaman should go out for a drink tonight. <laughs> Those are two mad guys right now. And Rabel puts the icing on the cake. This game is toast persevered pretty hard and, and to get back in that game and we had all the momentum and can't blame anything on a call or the ref but it just seemed like it was one of those games where it wasn't going to go our way no matter how hard we battled. Draft picks Jack Kelly and Matt Cavanaugh made their respective debuts on June 11th. Kelly, the fourth outlaw goalie in just seven games, promptly let up seven goals in the first quarter. His first game and a half, you know, I just said to him, what's the difference? He goes, volume. Oh my God, he said, I have never seen so many shots in a quarter. And then he said, I thought it was the end of the game and it was the end of the first quarter. It was the volume at that speed with that shot clock. It doesn't really get down to under 15, under 10 seconds that often when our team has the ball, so it's coming back down your throat a lot. And despite Kavanaugh's four-goal performance, Denver fell to Florida 19-16. At that point, we were ranked bottom of the league. I think that was Florida's first win of the season. For us, that's a, you know, a real bad loss. Yeah, that was tough. You never want to go in and give a team that hasn't won a game all year their first win, and it never feels good doing that. Whenever this team got down, there was no quit in them, and no one's heads ever really went down no matter who we were playing. It was just more of, like, how do we get this thing back on the right track. The Outlaws returned home for a week nine matchup with Rochester. Former Denver goalie Jesse Schwartzman was honored with a ceremony retiring his number. That would wind up being the highlight of the evening. For the first time in 2016, Denver lost a game at home. Oh, nifty move and a goal. I remember walking into that locker room and it's never been a locker room like I've ever been in before where not a single person talked, not a single person took anything off, moved, did anything to come here at home and lose like that. Similar to the Atlanta game, they beat us all over the field. 18 to 11, I don't even think the game was really as close as that score even indicates. We were just playing poor lacrosse. I think 
most of us in the organization would agree that was probably the low point in the season. That was the first game where we really didn't feel like we were competitive. At the end of that game, I remember Mike Evans and I looking at each other and just saying, they're rebuilding. At that point, I think everyone just kind of was open to suggestions, open to anything, because we knew that whatever was happening wasn't working. And we knew that something needed to change and everyone swore to each other that we were never gonna let that kind of performance happen again. With a record of two wins and six losses, what was once a few droplets of defeat had turned into a downpour. Two and six, you're almost thinking that the season's over. You know, this is going one of, of two ways here. We're either rolling over or we're, we're gonna have two wins for the rest of the year or we can buck up and try our best to make somewhat of a season. And who knows if we make the playoffs. The boss came in and sat down in the locker room after that slaughter and looked at all of us and said, this team is really bad. We are not fast. We don't play well offensively. We haven't done anything defensively. It's a disaster. You've got free reign to get rid of whoever you want to get rid of. Do whatever you got to do. They started by acquiring midfielder Nick Ocello from Chesapeake. When they got Nick Ocello, first of all, it was a great story because he's from the Denver area, went to Wheat Ridge High School, and his move signaled that perhaps this was a team that was starting to look ahead to the future. The trade paid off immediately. Ocello scored in the very next game, one that also saw Jack Kelly notch his first victory as a professional on a rare day game at Mile High. That was a great game. That was really cool. It was a Friday afternoon. We had a ton of kids from all the local camps around Denver that came to that game. There was a bunch of kids here wearing colored shirts and chanting outlaws and booing the other team. There was probably 4,000 kids here all screaming and all into the game, which I was so impressed by. It was anytime there was an outlaws goal scored, they were cheering. Whenever the New York team scored, they were booing, which I've never been a part of an ML game before. That, that was kind of the situation. We went back to the dressing room after that game thinking, you know what, we can do this. You know, it's, it's within our grasp. It's not a pipe dream. An outlaw, by definition, is a lawless person. But look again, and you will find another entry for the word, one who is unconventional or rebellious. Unconventional could have been the slogan for the entire league. In 2016, nothing was taken for granted in Major League Lacrosse. No job was safe. John Tucker has been fired, relieved of his duties uh, as head coach and GM after 10 games at the helm. No player was secure. Get this, top overall pick, Miles Jones, on the move after just two games, after just two, two games as a professional in Atlanta because, yeah, Hot Atlanta just traded him off to Chesapeake. And no goal was unattainable. Cannons will have 3.3. Go along. Oh! And it's in the net! Are you kidding Get me? Get out of here! It's in the net! In a year where anything in the league seemed possible, the Outlaws did the improbable. John Grant Jr. no longer a member of the Denver Outlaws and is making his way to Ohio. Unconventional indeed. We weren't shopping him around. Ohio came to us. They felt like he was the piece that they needed to make their run. I thought it would be an unbelievable place for him to play. And we just all agreed that given the scenario that Ohio presented to us and what they were willing to offer that we had to do it. We were two and six. I, I didn't think we were going to really get to the playoffs. We felt that if we had an opportunity to make our organization stronger and, and younger, that we certainly had to do it. We had capital. We have the young guy. He's just out of college. He's going to be a terrific player. He needs to play attack. He's a left-hander. Does he fit at attack with John? I don't think so. There's not room for both. The most unpopular trait of my life. For the Outlaws players, the loss of their legendary teammate stung as much as any defeat on the field. Yeah, I was, um, they traded John, man. I actually found out through John Grant Jr. actually sending me a text saying that he'd been traded and that he enjoyed playing with me. And the only thing I could think of was he was joking with me. Like, I, I honestly remember thinking, like, sending him one, a text back being like, ha-ha, so funny, like, nice try. I texted him right away and said, what the hell, you know? <laughs> I don't know if I can say it on camera, but <laughs> what the hell? I understand that he wrote the team a letter 
I understand that he made a lot of personal phone calls to guys on the team and thanked them for their time. You know, anytime you lose a guy like that, it's going to completely change your team. And it's not just the way he plays on the field, but the kind of guy he is in the locker room, in the post game, the way he keeps the team connected and how he leads by example. When you lose a guy like that, it's very difficult and you, you can never replace him. The move was a calculated risk that could make or break Denver's season. They were about to find out which on the league's biggest stage. to the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado. Big crowd on hand as it has become a 4th of July tradition, the Outlaws and the fireworks. This is going to be a fun night. It's one of the highlights of the season for us and for Outlaws fans because it is the 4th of July. Big crowd expected up over 30,000. The annual Independence Day game in Denver routinely draws the largest MLL crowd of the year. Going into that 4th of July game, Obviously the crowd, the fans here are just incredible. We have the best fans in the league and just 30,000 people there. Um, it was a great atmosphere, a great environment. Coach B.J. O'Hara's game plan had included playing both his goalies. I told both Adam and Jack that Jack was going to start the game and Adam would start the second half. As a coach, that's not an ideal scenario because you don't want to have to go back on your word. Jack played a great first half, but when we tell guys something, we're going to follow through. Shot saved, made by Kelly on Connor Busick. Oh, that was a beauty. But when Fullerton struggled in the third quarter, it was O'Hara who made the save of the night. And the change in goal, Fullerton is out, Jack Kelly's back in. It's always tough being a goalie come off the bench. I was supportive and, and really just wanted him to succeed and, and he played well. And at the end of the third quarter, about a minute left, Coach said I was going back in. And it's tough to take out a goalie when he's feeling the way that Jack was, and so I think it was the right decision to put him back in, and you kind of see his season just keep trending forward. Here's Busick, two-point goal, and Kelly makes the save. That was a beauty. When Jack came in again in the second half, you know, he did a great job, and I think for us, I, I was like, okay, Jack Kelly's our goalie now. And look how they're rallying around Jack Kelly. I think they found themselves a goalie. This could be the beginning of something pretty special for the Denver Outlaws. That was the end of that. We found out what we needed to know. Jack Kelly was our goalie. It was the first time Denver had won back-to-back -back games all year. It would not be the last. The Outlaws began to win. Here comes Bachman. He works in with a little face dodge. Nice. And a score! And win. Denver in transition, and they go ahead. It's Eric Law. And win. Snyder outlets. Sieverts on the dodge. He scores! You got the sense that, okay, this team is starting to figure things out a little bit. They're starting to get comfortable with their new mix of veteran players and young players. The younger players were taking more responsibility. The veteran players were working very well with them. For me, it wasn't even thinking about the playoffs. It was just thinking about the game right ahead of us and knowing that we needed to get that one if we even wanted to think about the next week. It just became more and more comfortable. Taking the field at each week became more comfortable. Going into the locker room, no matter what the scoreboard said, we were comfortable. It really was a team that nobody cared who got the credit. They just were trying to get a victory. The franchise that was ranked seventh in a nine-team league at the end of June began a steady climb in the standings. But then you started thinking, this is a team that actually has a little something, and maybe if the chips fall right, they might, they just might, be able to make some noise and maybe make a run for the playoffs. Going into those last two games, we knew that it was do or die. We knew it was either win and you maybe have a chance, and it was lose and you definitely don't, and, and you're going home. I had breakfast with Matt Bachlett and Eric Law when we were at the All-Star game. At this point, we were three and six, and we all sort of shared the sentiment that we could win, even at three and six. We were just saying one more. You know, one more, let's just get this one, and it's out of our hands. We did our job, we closed the season off strong. Strong may have been an understatement. The Outlaws reeled off six straight victories, each one behind a rookie goaltender from the Ivy League. Jack, after that, when um, on July 4th, he'd been playing with a ton of confidence, and I think he started to feel like he, he's one of the better goalies in the league, and he showed it for the rest of the year. He was unbelievable. The franchise that nearly blew up its roster midway through the season was now on the verge of a playoff game. Then again, so was nearly everyone else.
Heading into the last week of the regular season, seven of the nine MLL teams were in a position for a possible playoff berth. Only four of them could advance to the postseason. There were 16 different scenarios that could decide playoff outcomes. It was awful. <laughs> watching scoreboards, watching other guys play. When we got the memo from the league office with all the possible scenarios, after about three paragraphs, I was cross-eyed and I couldn't read it anymore. But on the last day of the regular season, the Outlaws had no game to play. With their season on the line, a bye week on the schedule would render them spectators. I remember thinking at that point, boy, if they can get in, they've got all this momentum, they're playing with house money, and they'll get a bye before the playoffs. They'll have a chance to rest up. What a perfect scenario if they can get in. Checking with coaches, like, are we actually in? Like, are we sure? I think we're in, but we're not really sure. It was my brother Chris's birthday. I remember we were out to dinner as a family and I'm checking Twitter to get the updates on the Boston game because of all the insane scenarios for us to make the playoffs. We were going through like so many scenarios. So if these guys beat them, yeah, I forget how many scenarios it was. It came to a point where it's like, I don't care. You know, it is what it is. It's gonna unfold how it unfolds. And sure enough, you know, we, we get that playoff berth. The cloudy playoff picture eventually came into focus. The Outlaws would be one of four teams to advance to the semifinals. Ohio would also make the list, thanks to a record-setting feat. Junior with five on the shot clock. Uh oh He's got oh! it! Oh! He's got it! Major League Lacrosse history for the first time ever. Someone has double-digit goals in a game. The funny thing about John Grant Jr. is you hear that he scores 10 goals and you're not even shocked. Maybe a little better day than normal for John, and you know he's such, a, such an amazing player. Ohio had an amazing player, Denver, now had an amazing team. I think that to some extent, the other teams were really aware that nobody wants to end up playing the Outlaws because they're the hottest team in the league. Despite a six-game winning streak, Denver would be positioned as underdogs in the semifinals. Their opponent, the New York Lizards, were defending MLL champions. This is a team that if you go back to the beginning of the season when they were struggling, to think at that moment they are gonna be in this situation going toe to toe, you couldn't even fathom the idea that they would be able to handle this situation. We were hot coming in and even then like we were underdogs and still playing like we didn't have anything to lose. A lot of people didn't even think we deserved to be there. I think this sounds negative but I think we were sort of a naive team. We were young and we just didn't have that sense of like hey we could possibly lose this game. Anytime you're playing a playoff everything's heightened. Your focus, you're really dialed in. Jack Kelly studied economics at Brown where financial theories often revolve around supply and demand. The Lizards supplied the shots. Kelly demanded excellence. There's a shot, and that was a kick save and a beauty from Kelly. Great save by Kelly. Here's Pinnell, can he get it? No, Kelly got him again. 17 saves in the game for the rookie Jack Kelly. I just went out every game, do my best, and that's all I could do. And this is just what I do, is I play lacrosse. It doesn't really matter who's shooting it or, or who's on the other side of the field or what level it is. It's just going out and having fun. Three Denver players tallied hat tricks, including a career best five goals from Matt Cavanaugh. They score! Cavanaugh with another rip! And he's got a five goal game here today. Lacrosse is all about momentum. And in a summer of crazy, the Outlaws had all the momentum. And once that momentum switched to them in that game, they were the team that was playing loose, and they were the team that was playing smart lacrosse. And guys just stepped up. Mike Bocklet had, you know, the pro game of his life, you know, on his old stadium ground, and Jack Kelly came up big again, and Matt Cavanaugh, you know, another rookie. The two Kellys and Cavanaugh, those people forget, those guys are rookies, you know, and they played like, you know, Wiley veterans. As the final whistle echoed and disappeared into the Connecticut air, so too did New York's chances of repeating as champions. And the Rook out of Brown comes through to help lead his team to a three goal win here in the semifinals. 20 to 17, Denver wins it. The stars aligned and Jack Kelly played unbelievable again and we pulled together as a team and, and got that win. We thought we could win, I think, but no one thought we would make it to the championship, which was awesome. We received a whole series of video clips from a whole bunch of the Denver Broncos from John Elway on down. Uh, wishing us good luck and urging the guys to bring back the championship.
what was once shaping up like a novel, the outlaw season now read like a movie script, one seemingly penned by fate itself. The final scene would include a familiar character, John Grant Jr. It felt like it was kind of like a, a Disney movie where team comes in, doing terrible, you have the best player in the world on your team and you trade him off to then all of a sudden now you're in the championship playing against that same guy who had 20 points in two games coming into that. So now you have, in my opinion, the greatest MLL player of all time, probably professional lacrosse player of all time, and you have to play against him in what might be his final game where he knows what to do in these championship games. I don't want to cover John Grant Jr. in a championship game and I don't know anyone who really does want to do that. There is nobody on the field that's going to want to beat us more than that guy, and he's the hardest guy in the world to cover and play against. This is Fifth Third Bank Stadium in Kennesaw, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. For the third straight year, it is home to the Major League Lacrosse Championship game. Tonight, the top seeded Ohio machine faces Denver for the 2016 MLL title. Let's play lacrosse. The 2016 Major League Lacrosse Championship game is underway from Kennesaw. The 2016 MLL Championship game would test each team's mettle, patience, and as it turned out, traction. The machine struck first, building a 6-2 lead at the end of the first quarter. Kyle Harrison from Johns Hopkins. Lefty shot, he scores! What a start! Kyle Harrison of Ohio. Icebreaker for the machine. Over the shoulder, he scores! John Grant Jr. has done it again. A spectacular goal for Ohio. And they've opened up a 6-2 lead on Denver. And they go on a little bit of run, and I remember John scoring behind the back, and that's where they really caught some steam, because when he does something magical like that, I know from being his teammate, you feed off that, and they did. We've been there before. There was no panic or anything like that. I think the uncertainty of when we could get back, and even if we were going to get back, was really the hard part. Relax a little bit. We've been here before. Right? 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 The Ohio Barrage continued in the second quarter as goals by Peter Baum, Steele Stanwick, and league MVP Tom Schreiber made it a 9-3 game. Schreiber over the shoulder, scores! Tom Schreiber from Stanwick, what a connection for Ohio! Machine has scored three of the four goals in the second quarter, and they are dominating the third-seeded Denver Outlaws here tonight. When they went down 9-3, there was a sense that maybe, you know, the clock had struck midnight for these guys. But just as the machine was rolling, so too was the thunder. A storm quickly tore through Fifth Third Bank Stadium, with the rain and lightning holding no regard for the title at stake. I remember thinking, like, we need a timeout, we need a break, and then here it comes. You see a big flash in the sky. The heavens opened up and we saw some thunder and lightning right in our vicinity. And I remember hearing their defense talk, being like, please don't let this be a delay. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, please, oh please, let this game stall out a little bit so we can go to the locker room and regroup. And the officials have stopped what? Obviously, you have to do this. And if you're Denver, couldn't come at a better time. It would be 97 minutes before play resumed. We've been here before. Who knows? Maybe we got ourselves a little reprieve, right? Let's take advantage of it. I'll tell you what. Whoever wants to be mentally tougher out there is going to come away with a victory, right? It ain't going to be pretty. Let's just be tougher than that, right? I've had so many people ask me what was going on in that locker room. Was everyone freaking out and yelling at each other? And it was actually calm and collected. Big storms help trees grow stronger roots. Just talking about adversity and now the whole season's been this way. I wouldn't want this game to be any other way. Battling our asses back, come back in this game. Oh. Last on three, one, two, three. Oh. I give a lot of credit to Eric Wall. He, he kind of rallied us a little bit set the stage of like, we're just playing in the backyard having fun and, and we got nothing to lose and let, let's just go have some fun and play hard. Eric Law was just, he just showed what, what kind of a, a person he was and what kind of leader he was. He kind of rallied the troops and, and was like, we have nothing to lose, let's go out there and play, have fun, and, and uh, that's what we did. In nature, the effects of a storm can often lead to renewed life. Such was the case on this night in Kennesaw, Georgia. And watching Kavanaugh charge toward the goal and score, Matt Kavanaugh. Open shot, score, Denver. Pass in front, Snyder, quick stick, goal. Goes high, scores. Eric Law from X. Four in a row for Denver after the delay. And how about 
the Denver Outlaws. Four goals in less than two minutes of play. It was as if the word drought suddenly disappeared from existence. All you've done is get yourself back in. Yeah, we're just looking at a long way to go. Long way to go. I think it changed the dynamic of the game a little bit. Ohio was on a roll and it kind of slowed their momentum a little bit and we came out flying after that. Momentum can arrive abruptly, then exit just as fast. The Ohio machine were not about to be washed away. Fetcher Harrison up top. Holman, shoot, shoot and scores. Lefty blast, gets it going for Ohio. Passing in front, Harrison feeding, Holman finishing. Stan McFree, righty shot, scores. Steel Stanwick walked in, and Ohio has scored five straight to take control again, 14-7. What a lot of people forget is we scored four goals in two minutes. They scored five after that. So we went in at halftime in worse shape than before the rain. As halftime hit, Ohio held a commanding 14-7 lead. No team had ever come back from a seven-goal deficit to win an MLL championship. Going into half, oof, I was like, damn. just shot ourselves in the foot. We brought it back. It was a game, and just like that, we're back down even more. We're just kind of like, man, this is bad. I want this to be over. You know, we're getting crushed. The city of Denver was officially founded as a part of the Colorado Gold Rush. 158 years later, its lacrosse team found a gold rush. Passing in front, Kavanaugh, doorstep scores. Snyder, passing in front, Law, spin, scores. Eric Law has another for Denver. Drew Snyder cranks, it's a two, it's a score. From long range, a two-pointer for Drew Snyder. Game changer. And they've got it again here. Downing handles. Knows what to do with a run. Spin scores to tie the game. And can you believe it? We are tied 14-14 in the third quarter. The Outlaws went on an 11-1 run in the first 18 minutes of the second half. What we had learned after the rain delay was that our offense was going to be able to score. It was just a matter of, is our defense going to get stops? A little over one minute into the fourth quarter, West Bird gave them their first lead of the game. West Bird charging it. Goes high, scores! West Bird! Fools Rogers. And how about Denver? For the first time tonight, the Outlaws have a lead at 16-15. It was good to finally get the lead, and it just gave us a lot of fire to get back into that, and, and we felt you know, that nobody was going to stop us at that point. But seven minutes later, the machine found its footing. Outside the arc, right wing, passing, Bernhardt scoring! It's another for Ohio, and yes, we are tied again. 18-18 in this incredible championship game. It was just two heavyweights. Two heavyweights who wanted it, and they were going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and they were just deciding whoever has the ball last is gonna win this game. With the score tied at 18, Ohio placed the ball in the hands of league MVP Tom Shriver. Denver placed its hope in the hands of a seventh round draft pick, Jack Kelly. He was on the right side, he was kind of coming up the hash. Shriver likes to get a lot of twists in his shot from, from his hips and shoots a lot from his hip and he's coming around to his right side and you know Nick was playing good defense. You know two great players going against each other. I knew we probably weren't going to slide and let him make a feed. He's such a great feeder. Right as Shriver's about to shoot, Nick falls over. Shriver tried to shoot through him. He didn't really uh, try to beat him so he took a shot kind of off of Nick's hip and didn't have a lot on it. I don't think Shriver knew he was already in the middle of his shot but he probably could have turned and started going towards the goal and there wasn't going to be anyone there but uh, he was already shooting. Driver, watched by Ocello, re-triggers. Driver, right-hand shot, goal stick stop. Jack Kelly, the rookie. It kind of went hip level between my, my hip and my knee, and the ball just wound up in my stick, and it was very nerve-wracking for sure. Jack made a really good save on it, and out we came, you know, on a fast break, and there wasn't a lot of coaching going on by then. The first thing that, was, that went into my head was, all right, we did our job on the defensive end. It's up to them now. With the seconds ticking off, Fans prepared for a possible overtime. Destiny made other arrangements. We do a lot of things organizationally during the course of a game, but when it comes down to crunch time, that's when your stars step up and make plays. For an outlaw to exist, one cannot avoid that from which the term came. On this night, in order to knock Ohio out, Denver 
relied on law. I looked up at the clock and saw that there was only 30 seconds left and knew that we were going to need to make a play. Snyder across the midfield line. We uh, transition, um, sub the defensive players off. I come on, I get it. Kind of a little bit of a hairy situation, and I see Jeremy behind me. Trying to win it here for Denver. Shovels back to Sieverts. I just called for him to drop it, and he just, without hesitating, flipped it back to me, and I caught it. I could see the whole thing. I was directly behind him, and I saw Eric flash from behind the goal, and I thought, oh, he's open. I've had a lot of people ask me if I was shooting or passing. It looks like Jeremy's about to kind of wind up and shoot. I didn't think he was going to shoot it. I think Eric did. That was probably more important than what I thought. I see him winding up, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking he's shooting this 100%. I was passing 100%. He wouldn't have caught it if I was shooting. Eli just kind of flashes his stick and kind of cuts into that. There's a little gap. His defenseman was a little too far off of him, and he got right in that seam where Scotty Rogers couldn't come out of the cage to intercept it. And the only thing I could think of was kind of put myself in a position that if there was a rebound, I could get there and maybe try to pick up the trash and sneak in a garbage goal. Jeremy throws it right into it. Eric makes a great handle, turns. He had, you know, some space, threw it to him. Eric made an unbelievable grab off his shoestrings and then shot it sort of around the defender. It was a great handle and, and the finish he made was spectacular. Fakes in front, Law shoots, he scores! Eric Law scores for Denver! With 12.9 to go in regulation, the Outlaws have taken the 19 -8. Closing in on the championship. I don't know how he did that, some kind of fold over shot that he was able to put in that opposite low corner, which was just absolutely insane. I, I could not believe it. I'm glad that this was the thoughts going through my head because I was happy that it had because as soon as he threw me the ball, my mind went blank and it was just see the ball, catch the ball, and get it off as quick as you can. And so I just kind of turned and I think I surprised myself, just along with everyone else, that it actually went in. I remember him scoring and jumping up and going crazy, but then looking at the clock and seeing 12 seconds. His celebration was awesome. I remember that, and I remember being like, wow, we just went up one in a game that everyone counted us out. That's one of the beautiful things about Major League Lacrosse is the game is always in reach. And that's it! For the second time in three years, Denver does it! The Outlaws are 2016 Major League Lacrosse champions! Eric Law's game-winning goal with 12.9 seconds left completed the greatest comeback in league championship history. The Outlaws won 19-18, with Law being named the game MVP. A magical season, and you think about all the crazy things that happened along the way, maybe the most fitting moment of all was a guy like Law being the hero. We were two and six. We were two and six, and we closed eight games in a row, win streak. And I, I just have never been a part of something like that. We went from dead last in the entire league, and even if we dropped a game, we wouldn't have even been in playoffs. And it was pretty crazy to think about, and it just kind of made the win in the championship that much sweeter. I remember in the locker room after the game thinking, like, we got to get this trophy out of here and take it home, or they're going to come take it from us. I'm just kind of feeling like that we'd stolen one. Our guys worked so hard and, and really came together as a team. It's just an incredible, incredible run that I, I still, to this day, think about. I'm like, how did we manage to do that? It was a long way from a two and six record and roster upheaval. It was a mile high from the downtrodden doubts and championship game despair. Emotionally, physically, just what we went through as a team, I couldn't help, I just started crying. I can remember looking at Coach Seaman and just looking and said, how did we how did we ever do this? You know, it was an amazing accomplishment by a tremendous group of the guys. For Denver, the calm this year came after the storm. I'd never been a part of a team before that everyone absolutely loved playing with each other. And you could see it whenever any time anyone scored, teammates were more excited for the teammate that scored than their own success. And, and when you truly find that in a team and in a player, that's when you can truly be successful and that's when you can truly be a great team.